West Cobb was founded to shine the light of the gospel to those far from God, opening our doors to the people of our community. We said welcome home to every person from every past, and God began writing our story. We have seen lives changed. We've seen people made whole. We've seen families and marriages restored. We've impacted the next generation and we've reached around the world and made a difference. It's been 25 years now, but next isn't about the past. It's about the future. God has turned the page and has begun to write our next chapter. Next isn't about where we are, but about where we're going. It isn't just for those already here, but for those who are yet to come. Because next is way more than renovation. This is restoration, bringing more and more people into the family of God, increasing the size of heaven one life at a time. Next is about believing that kids in our community need a safe and fun and exciting place to learn about Jesus because we aren't babysitting. We are raising up the next generation of worshipers. Next is about believing that students in our community are searching for answers and will gather wherever they are accepted and loved right where they are. It's about believing that these very students can change the world. Next won't take a few of us. It will take all of us, each of us, sacrificing in new ways, giving above and beyond what we normally give, believing that the more we lean on God and trust Him, the more we will experience His grace. It's time to reach beyond new spaces, new faces, new families, moving forward with a new passion for our mission of helping people find and follow Jesus. It's time. It's time for what's next. Hey, welcome to this season of thankfulness. Welcome to Thanksgiving. This is more than just welcome to church, like welcome to the season. That's pretty cool. I'm glad you're here. Uh, I would like to offer a prayer time at the end of our service today for the men in here. Do you realize what's going to happen this week outside of people eating a whole lot and some of you getting a break to go visit family members on Thursday around between the hours of two and four o'clock? Do you realize the hospitals around here get prepped for men, because there's, there's guys who think, and they're over 40, that they can go out and play football. <laughs> and you're laughing. That, no, you're not, you, you're praying, okay. Yeah, there's the hospitals, actually, this is a running thing with those of us who worked in the medical profession. We know what's gonna happen on, th there's a lull before the storm, and there's gonna be wives with that look on their face that says, I told him so, that are gonna be pulling their husbands in from either football injuries or uh, turkey accidents. Uh, guys, guys feel the need to fry uh, birds on Thursday, and, and they, yeah, God bless them. All right. <clears throat> Welcome to the season of Thanksgiving. I'm going to ask you a question that you're probably going to get asked a lot this week. You're going to get asked by your family, probably coworkers. If uh, kids, you're in school, you've already been asked this. You're, you're going to hear it on social media. It's going to get light, start lighting up this week. You're, you're going to see it on commercials. Uh, they start the Publix commercials this time of year. Uh, the same one with the little salt and pepper shakers, you know, run around the table. That's creepy. They also do the, um, the one with the little girl that when grandpa comes, you end up crying and mad at your TV because well, all for public supermarket. Here's the question. Uh, you've probably been asked already. What are you? Say it. <laughs> oh, you've heard this. <laughs> yeah, what are you thankful for? We take this time of our year as a season, uh, and hopefully it's not the only time we stop and think, what are we thankful for? I'm gonna ask us, though, to take one step further and think about why we're thankful for that. When you came in, you got some name tags, hopefully, and you were given the opportunity to write down something you're thankful for. Hopefully, you had an answer. But did you, did you stop to think about the why? Because what we're thankful for, that quick answer that we have, 
versus the why behind we're thankful for it are two very different things. And they actually have two very different impacts on our life as well as the people around us when we stop to actually think about the things that we say we're thankful for, right? I had a teacher in high school that I absolutely could not stand, and he ended up probably being one of the best things that ever happened to me. My English professor, uh, he, he liked that we had the ability to write papers <laughs> more than I liked that we had the ability to write papers. We wrote and wrote and wrote in his class. We would read a book. We would have five days to read this book, and we would have uh, the weekend to write a paper on this, and, and then we'd bring it back in, and the big company, the, the Red Pens, actually sponsored this guy. They sent him a thank you letter at the end of every fiscal year for being the sole supporter of Red Ink. He would just rip through those, but then he stopped part of the way through the year, because here's what he wrote after every paragraph. He ended up getting a rubber stamp that said, this little three-letter ugly word, I'm embarrassed to say this in public. It said, why? Why? And this is why it became a bad word to me, because he started running through things at ink after every paragraph, every sentence. Why? Well, the character in this story, blah, blah, blah. Well, why? They did it. Well, why? And he'd give our papers back on Tuesday, and we get to rewrite the entire thing. And the next day, why? And we get to rewrite the entire thing. This continued my entire year. And he said, when you get to the point where you cannot uh, ask why anymore, that means you've explained things correctly and you've thought things out differently and you've done a good job. And that was more than getting through English for me. That was a life lesson. When you really start to take the time to examine it and dig down into the why, it really changes everything for us. And I started thinking, we as Christians, we, we get really used to this, where we come in and we sing songs about Jesus, we're thankful for salvation, we pass an offering plate, we see the people, we use, and we get in our routine. And we stop to really be in wonder about what is occurring here this morning. I mean, think about it. A lot of you went through some pretty big challenges just to even get here in life, much less just this morning. And we had the opportunity to gather together in a community with people that we know and love and people that know and love us or people that love us that don't even know us because we're here. And we got to come before God, the maker of the entire universe, and just put life aside for a few minutes this morning and just be with him and other people who are just trying to make it too. That's pretty outstanding, isn't it? We miss it, don't we? We stop asking the why. And it's pretty easy, easy for us to do that with things that we say we're thankful for as well, right? You know who doesn't have this problem? Kids. Kids do not have this problem at all. You ask a kid what they're thankful for, there's probably a kid who's still out there trying to fill out his name tag right now. They go on and on and on, and isn't it magnificent? Have you ever heard a little kid pray? Have you ever asked a little kid to pray before a meal when you're hungry? It's not a good idea because they're thankful for everything, especially the little girls, everything. And your, your stomach's rumbling and you're just like, good word, why did I ask my niece to pray a blessing over this? Do you know that the reason that is probably a dad who invented those poem prayers or the little sing songs because they're only gonna be this long? But kids go on and on and on because they're legitimately in their heart thankful for everything. I love talking to kids uh, when the weather's nice. Uh, my, I have two daughters, and when they were little, everything was a miracle. You walk outside, the sky wasn't just there. It was the most incredible shade of blue you have ever seen today. And there are clouds, and God made the world color instead of just black and white, and there's insects buzzing by, and you can hear them, and there's these trees, and can you feel the wind on your skin? And they just go on and on, and I'm like, can we please just go get the mail out of the mailbox? <laughs> but what a great life to live, a life where you look around and you see thankfulness everywhere, right? I can't help but think this is one of the reasons Jesus liked to hang out with little kids when the adults were starting to get annoying because we get focused on such the wrong things, right? He thought, I'm gonna go hang out with people who are grateful, 
Where's the little folks? You're laughing, but it's true, isn't it? So on Wednesday, we're doing this thing called Next, and I had the opportunity to hang out with the fun people. We were over in the kids' department, and we did something that took a whole lot longer than I was anticipating. And I said, hey, we're going to talk about, since Thanksgiving's coming up, things that we're thankful for. And I handed out everybody a sheet. It says, I am thankful for. And, and I said, just write what you want. But but think about it. Let's take a time to think about it. I didn't have to explain anything. I didn't have to print directions. I didn't have to guide them into anything and keep encouraging. They were like, where are the colors? I'm like, they're over here. Boom. We handed out crayons, colored pencils, markers. They were just going at it. All you could hear was... And they were looking over. Oh, yeah, me too. And just going. I, I had to call it quits on what the kids were thankful for. In fact, we got... <laughs> They ended up filling up their little papers, and I went and got a big sheet of butcher paper. I'm like, have at it. And everybody hit the floor, and they're just going and going. I had to pick one up out of the middle and say, hey, leave some space for everybody else. This is where it got fun. Uh, we, were, we started into a little bit of an argument about how to spell something, and so they're like, forget it, and just started drawing pictures. And we spent the rest of our evening Wednesday trying to figure out, oh, okay, those are trees. Oh, that's your family. Oh, that's your pets. Oh, you don't have pets. That's the pet you wish you have. You're thankful for things that don't even exist. How great is that? And then I had to go back and hang out with the adults. So I like, ah, got to go to work tomorrow. What's wrong with our perspective? So I thought I would share a couple of lists that I brought. And this one... Um, this one was from my friend Connor, and he filled his paper up and said, uh, Pastor Todd, I'm sorry, I decided to stop at 25 things. I ran out of space. And these are, these are the things that an elementary boy was thankful for. TV, mom, these were not in any order, by the way. Uh, TV, mom, friends, dad, home, soccer, baseball, donuts, pizza, God, Jesus, again, not in any particular order, healing. How many of y'all had that on your list? Food, ice cream, candy, freedom, my church, pain, giving, earth, music, tech, and school. And then I did something fun. I challenged him on his list. I said, hey, I want to know why just to see if they were writing, you know, the thing that me and you do. So let's go down your list. Why is a boy in elementary school thankful for school? I think you're just saying that. He said, no, it's where I actually get to spend some time with my friends. I have teachers that really want me to be smart. It's going to help me in my... And he just went on and on. I'm like, whoa, okay. And why are you thankful for church? And his list was just as long as the first list of things he was thankful for. And we went on and on and on. And he had a great answer for why. So why can kids rattle off things they're thankful for? Because they think about why they're thankful for them and they have a why. And this is my, my list of the little girl. That one's actually up on the screen. These may be in order of things she's thankful for. Glitter, <laughs> flowers, watermelon, mom, writing utensils, jackets, pizza, Google, Thanksgiving, Christmas, s'mores, Sister, cookie cake, school, artificial wool. <laughs> I didn't ask that one. Bible, brother, USA, birthdays, Disney Plus, trees, shoes, dad. <laughs> Wait a minute. Socks, costumes, couches, beds, rainbows, home, dogs, heart, my brain, hair, skin. Skin's something we all take for granted, isn't it? And this is my favorite, pigs, in many ways. <laughs> that one I did ask about. She said, well, they're both cute and delicious. <laughs> and everyone said, amen. So here's my point. I started looking up the effects of being grateful. And I could still be reading. I've been, I've been trying to get ready for this for weeks. And there's so much out there on the life shifts that happen to a grateful person. It's phenomenal. And the benefits just don't seem to end. I was reading a report in Psychology Today, and it said this. When we feel and express, those are two things there. When we feel 
and express, which are two things past. We just normally think about it. But when you take the time to feel and express gratitude, it can cause a chain reaction of reciprocal good deeds, which reinforce feelings of appreciation between those in a relationship. Which means this, gratitude sparks a chain reaction that changes your reactions. Gratitude sparks a chain reaction that changes our reactions to the world around us. Gratitude sparks a chain reaction that changes our reactions to the people around us. And here's why. You cannot be legitimately thankful for a thing or a circumstance or a person without it shifting how you think and feel about them. It can't. That person at work who drives you nuts when you take the time to get to know them and the why they behave how they do and you try, sometimes you try really hard to find some redeeming factor in them. But when you can do that, all of a sudden it takes the tension off of your relationship, right? When we, as parents of little people, take the time to realize, yes, I don't get to sleep anymore, more than four hours, and it's all broken up, but there's this little tiny pair of hands that gets to hold on to my finger in the mornings when I wake up. Um, Oftentimes, uh, after we've gone through some sort of trauma, we can see the other end and realize the things we've taken for granted in between. It shifts, right? So gratitude causes a chain reaction that changes our reactions. That's the whole point. Gratitude never, ever changes. Your gratitude doesn't change other people. Now, when you decide to express it, it does. Gratitude deeply, deeply affects us. So if you walk away with nothing else, I want you to walk away with that phrase in your head because it changes when somebody's gonna ask this, hey, what are you thankful for? Because I want you to ask the why because it's gonna spark some other things inside you that will force some relationship changes with the people around you. Gratitude causes a chain reaction and changes your reactions to the world. Everybody got it? Put that back up on the screen for me. I'm getting a few head nods, but I have to prove this. I'm sorry, I work with kids. We're gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna make you do motions, but I do need to hear this because I need to know you have it. Are you ready? Gratitude sparks a chain reaction that changes your reactions. And you can fill in the blank after that to the world around you, to the people around you, to your circumstances, to my job, to my home, to my relationship with the Lord. So there are three phases of gratitude I want to talk to you about today. The first one is realization. That's when you answer the question, what are you thankful for? This is the easy part. All my type A's just got their pens out. They're ready to fill out an outline. This one's for you. Realization. Three phases of gratitude. The first one's realization. That's when you take the time to go, hey, that person or that thing uh, had a positive impact on my life. You, You realize it. That's very quick. The second one is this acknowledgement. When we stop to take the time to to acknowledge it in our head, but then to process it in some way to the person or thing that did something for us. You start to acknowledge it. This is the the parental nudge with kids. We have it all the time in kids' ministry. When I give a kid something or I tell them something or I tell the parent they were great today and the kid just, they're off in space, just thinking about whatever or thinking about things that they're grateful for, right? And the parent nudges them and does what? Tell him Thank you, yeah. The realization and thanking the kids. And thank you, that's our automatic response. But here's the third one that we don't usually go into. And this is what the scriptures asked us to do is the thoughtfulness. First is realization, then acknowledgement. And what we fail to do most of the time is lead into the thoughtfulness part. That's the pondering and searching of the why. This is the one that sparks a reaction that changes our reactions to the world around us. It's when we become thoughtful about the things that we're thankful for. See, many of us don't have life problems near as much as we actually have perspective problems. Many of us don't have the life problems we think we do. It's a perspective problem. This is the whole uh, third world happiness syndrome. I get to travel and do missions a whole lot, and we, we usually always have someone who's never been with us. The question is guaranteed to come. We're hanging out with people who have houses the size of the speaker on stage. They don't know where their next meal is coming from. But I always hear it. They are so happy. Why are these kids playing? Why are these adults smiling? Don't they know how hard they have it? Well, the difference is you don't know how good you have it. And they're incredibly grateful for things that we take for granted. They're not worried that they don't know where lunch is coming from. They're thankful that somebody provided breakfast. 
They're not worried about what their home looks like compared to the next house because they have a roof over their head for the night. They realize that they're surrounded by great things like people. And they're, they're, they have more of a kid thought process on the things that they are thankful for because it's real and tangible and not taking it for granted. They, they live in the realm of thoughtfulness for things that they're grateful for. And when you focus on gratitude, your perspective on everything shifts. Now, here's some things that gratitude does for us. I had to narrow it down. We could have this talk all day long. There was a study done at Berkeley not too long ago on the benefits of writing a letter of gratitude, a thank you letter, a sincere letter. They had people pick one thing, one person, and write out a thoughtful letter of gratitude, which made them have to go through that chain reaction. Well, you did this and it caused this, and now I this, because you this. And they went through this whole thing. They figured out, um, they filled out this letter. And here's what happened. The first thing that they realized, and they, they followed these people for some weeks and also actually did brain scans while they're going through and reading through their own letters to see what part of their brains are lighting up. And it's completely, uh, it, it, was, it was very interesting. I'll say that. Gratitude unshackles us from toxic emotions was the first and most prominent thing. Gratitude unshackles us from the things that people were upset about, even if they were writing a letter to somebody with whom they've had conflict. But it actually disconnected the part of frustration in their brain and rewired it to go a different route. Gratitude helps even if they didn't share the letter. Even if they didn't actually send that letter to that person, the fact that they took the time to think it out and write it out changed them from a mental perspective. Gratitude's benefits, their full benefits, take time. One big thing about the study is they found out that uh, gratitude in your mind uh, actually has great changes. It will actually even change you physically eventually uh, with the happiness factors that your brain starts spitting out. But it's like working out with anything. It takes some time. And it's an exercise habit. So it really is a, a habit that you can develop and grow over time that changes the way your brain actually processes. Another thing is that gratitude had long lasting effects on the neuropathways in your brain. Long-lasting effects. They said that they found these effects, uh, even for people that weren't in the habit of practicing gratitude, they found these effects lasted for up to 12 weeks after writing one letter. 12 weeks that the person who wrote the letter was impacted. Um, So during this perspective shift, the neuropathways in the mind actually started traveling through the reward centers of your brain, the same things that trigger happiness and joy, just from writing out a thoughtful letter of gratitude. So... Why does it matter? Why does this matter to me and you? Why should I care if you are thankful for the things and people in your life or not? It matters actually a great deal. It matters because it defines what kind of human being you and I are going to be this week. Gratitude defines what kind of human you and I are going to be this week. And you're part of my community. And community uplifts each other. And it does that because literally it changes your perspective. Gratitude changes how you're seeing things around you. Gratitude is also the foundation of humbleness. Think about it. Who are the most humble people that you know? Everybody knows that one person. Well, how do you even get that? You're grateful. You're grateful. Humbleness always comes from the attitude of gratefulness. And the interesting thing is, this is a chain reaction too, grateful people are humble people, and humble people are usually the ones who have deep-seated joy in their life, the kind that you and I wish that we had regularly. Uh, Giving thanks keeps us happy. And also, here's my big kicker for those of you who are church people and you've been going to church for a while. Gratitude actually fulfills God's will for your life. Did you know that? When you are a person of gratitude and thankfulness, this actually fulfills God's will for your life. How many times have we as Christians struggled and said, I just wanna know what God's will is. We've got this next step, this next, we've got a career, maybe it's a move, maybe it's having kids, maybe it's getting married, maybe it's getting unmarried, all these things that we struggle with and we ask this question, we cry out, we ask for prayer requests, I just need to know God's will for X. Maybe it's different than we thought. Read this scripture with me for a minute. It's found in 1 Thessalonians 5. It says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And I can't help but think, what if we just focused on that when we have these major questions and we're, we're trying to figure out what is God's will for my life? What if we put the actual question, what we think it is aside and just focus on that for a minute? 
What if we just shifted to be thankful and start praying and rejoicing for what we have? Maybe the answers will start to become a little more clear. Maybe we're asking the wrong question. And if we focus on this and fulfilling God's will for us, life becomes a little more clear. One of my favorite stories is found in the book of Luke. It's in Luke 17. For those of you who don't know, Luke was not a disciple. He was not a Bible writer. He didn't even know he was writing the Bible when he wrote this down. He was a physician. He was a doctor. You know what a doctor is and how, how literal they are about things and how they want to be technical. And Luke got the opportunity. He, he put his career on the side for a minute to go interview people and find out what this guy, Jesus Christ, was and what he did and why he was changing this entire part of the continent. And he followed around and he shared this story um, about Christ and it has a lot to do with just the power of gratitude. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And I'm going to stop there in the middle of this and explain things from a historical context. There was no one road between Samaria and Galilee while he was, where he was traveling. This is talking about some borders of some areas that did not get along. They fought. What this is telling us is that Jesus intentionally, on purpose, was hanging out in hostile environments, places that were not comfortable for him or his disciples just because there were some people to love. Are you following? He went to some uncomfortable places on purpose. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. Now, the word leprosy actually is a broad term there for any skin disease that's contagious. And these 10 guys were together because once you had a very contagious disease, you were cast out of society and you had to go to a place where you couldn't infect anybody else. Everybody with me? All right. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. They were actually following a law at the time. If you did have a contagious disease like that, you were not allowed to go around other people or they'd kill you so that you would stop infecting people. So they're yelling out. And they found something very interesting uh, here they knew who they were talking to. Let's not take that for granted. They knew who they were talking to. They called him Jesus, master. They approached him with, with some faith there. When he saw them, he said, go and show yourselves to the priests. This was a law. This was one of the things set back in Leviticus. If you had a contagious disease and you were outcast, before you were allowed to come back to society, if you healed, which happens, people get hurt and people heal regularly, okay? Okay. So this was a thing. So if it happened to you back then, you had to go show yourself to a priest who went through a big deal and you made a sacrifice and they said, okay, you're clean, you're good, no more sores, you can go back to society. It was a big deal. Jesus saw them and said, go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. There's a couple of things I want you to note here. Uh, when did he go back and give thanks to Jesus? When he saw he was healed, not after he finished his journey, not after he finished what he had to do, the task at hand. They were all healed on the way. And when he saw he was healed, he dropped everything. The most important thing that he could think to do at the time was to give thanks and very deep thanks. In a loud voice, he cried out, the interesting thing is that he was a Samaritan. Samaritans and Jews did not get along. They weren't even socially talking to people, which is interesting. If you keep reading the Gospels, Jesus talked to Samaritans a lot. But this guy wasn't even supposed to be talking to Christ, a rabbi. But he came back and, and thanked him. And Jesus said, we're, we're not all 10 cleansed. Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And Jesus didn't just mean where he was physically from. Foreigner, meaning he, he was not familiar with the ways of the Christ. He wasn't familiar with God's traditions because they didn't follow the same customs as the Hebrews. He was foreign to understanding uh, God's laws and God's ways, and yet he still got it. This is uh, one of the many, many examples of people who weren't Christ followers still doing the right thing while his people ignored it. I don't want to be us. I don't want that to be us. Rise and go, your faith has made you well. I always found that so very interesting that Jesus attached this man's gratitude, his thanksgiving to faith. His faith. And Jesus told him, go. He didn't, he didn't send him back to the priest. He didn't say, do what you need to do. He didn't say, follow the laws. He's like, okay, you know what? You were faithful. Go, you're well. And that's healed you. Now, let's follow our chain reaction plan here. 
He could have just said, and this is where we think, we skip over this passage pretty quick. And we think, oh, he was healed of his skin disease. That's great. What was the actual chain reaction that changed his reactions to the rest of the world after he got healed? It wasn't just, my word, I've, I've been physically healed. What did this mean for this guy? Well, it also meant he got to go back into society. He got to go be around his family. He got to talk to people. He got to go to a house of worship. He got to go to the market again. He got to have a job and support himself. He wasn't waiting on the kindness of others to know where he was going to eat anymore. He got his self-respect back as a man. He got the opportunity to lay at the feet of Christ. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So I don't know what you chose to write down that you were thankful for this morning. But what's your why? What's your why? And the great thing about this guy is information plus application equals transformation, right? He had the information, he knew. He knew what he was thankful for, but then he did something about it. You see, that's the key, that's the difference. What if we all decide to do something about what we're thankful for? That's pretty cool. So here's some applications. How can we become people of gratitude? Because it does take practice. If you are not in the habit of being intentionally thankful, I mean, we're all casually thankful. But if you're not in the habit of being intentionally thankful, what are some things that you can do and take home and start trying to get in that habit? Uh, Here's my list. Keep a gratitude journal. Keep a gratitude journal. That means writing it down. It's one thing to think something. It's another thing to feel something. When you take the actual step to physically do something, it sticks it in and makes a difference. I use something called the the five-minute journal every morning, and every evening, I write down three things I'm thankful for, and then the why, and then in the evening, I write down, hey, what, what happened during the day, and what are you thankful for? And it is literally changing how I think about my day. Write letters of gratitude. It's gonna be hard for some of you because you already know the person that you need to be writing that to. You don't have to send it even if it's that, that tough. But if you do, it might change them. Um, thankful, thoughtful prayers. Say it and say it specifically. Start treasuring the good around you for the day. Start a Bible plan on you version and on thankfulness. Make a list and share the list. I got the opportunity a couple weeks ago. I had breakfast with Gary Chapman. Gary wrote a little book called The Five Love Languages. And this book has outsold itself for 10 years straight. It's, it's been the number one bestseller for years and years and years and years. And uh, I got to sit like this far and, and ask him questions about, I love the book. I love your ministry. How's it really work at your house? Like, let's get real. And you know what he does? He actually wrote down a list on, like, it's two sides of paper. And it's pretty small about things he loves about his wife. I'm thankful for her because, and he started writing and writing and writing and writing and writing, and he wrote the whys. It just caused this chain reaction of realizing why he got together with this lady in the first place. He said, and anytime I'm frustrated, anytime we are not getting along, anytime I feel like I'm not her man, I go and pull my list out. Because when you read through what you're thankful for in a person, you just can't be upset at him anymore. Because you remember. Gratitude helps us remember. Give thanks to the people that have blessed you in some way. Make the phone call. Write the letter. Do what you need to do. And the chain reaction here is it isn't just us. It's not that we get changed and the perspective and everything I've talked about is absolutely true and it is God's will for your life and it will change you. But when we get to the, the action part, when we start to do something, because true gratitude demands action, right? If you're really thankful for something, you're gonna do something about it. I mean, if you're thankful for your church, this is where you're gonna give, this is where you're gonna serve, this is where you're gonna gather in community, and this is where you're gonna worship the Lord. If you're thankful for your spouse, it's gonna change the way you react to them. If you're thankful for your kids, if you're thankful for your car, for crying out loud, we have one, right? It changes the way you're gonna do things. It demands an action. So here's what I want you to think about this week. I am grateful for blank, therefore I will blank. For you, it's the quickest path to joy. For somebody else, it may be a life-changing moment. Somebody just may need to hear that they've made a difference in your life in a big or small way. So think about it for a minute. What would be different in your world? What would be different in my world? What would be different in our community if we decide to actually become a people who like to practice the art of gratitude, 
What if it became a thing to you? I mean, I can't think of much more than somebody to say, yeah, that guy, he really appreciates people. Because people who appreciate people, they're really assigning great value to others. And that reminds me a whole lot of Jesus. So I can't think of a better way to end our morning together than to have communion and come before God. And I'm going to ask you to think about it a little, a little differently today. I want you to think about the why. Why are you thankful to, to God? What is it about salvation that changed you? What is it about being around this community of believers? Let's just take a minute to be together and legitimately give thanks for all that's been given to us. Let me pray for you. And David's going to come and lead us. Good morning, God. I just don't have the words to convey thanks this morning for all that you've given us. I'd ask you to hear my heart. 